Good morning, folks. It's nice to be here. It's nice to see so many of you out uh, this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk about, obviously, the role of exercise science in sport and health, and just give you a, a quick background about myself. I did my undergraduate degree in physical education many years ago, too many to, to think now, and I always had a tremendous passion for elite sport performance. I wanted to work with world-class athletes, and just to show you where science can take you. I then went to America to study for my master's degree at a place called Purdue University. And the, the University of Pittsburgh, where I went at that time, it was Thoman College, there were 200 students. And at Purdue University, there were 72,000. So it was quite a change from, from, from Limerick to go to America. And I studied performance physiology, working with elite athletes. I then went back to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center to study again for a PhD. And I, worked, I started working with elite world-class athletes. And during my studies, in America, doing a graduate studies is a little bit different to Ireland, where you take lots of courses. And I'd been introduced to cell biology, to molecular genetics, to immunology. And it was towards the end of my PhD, I started to realize that exercise could have a tremendous impact on the health of people. And as I show you this morning, I think to be a world-class athlete, you better pick your parents right, because it's, you have to have the right genes. Whereas exercise could have a tremendous impact and I went from working with elite world-class athletes to spending 12 years working in nuclear and preventive cardiology, working with people who, had anything, who were anything but healthy, because exercise has a tremendous impact on the other 99% of the world's population. And so this morning, I'm going to break this talk into two sections. One is going to be on sport and the science of sport and showing you where we use science to improve sporting performance. And the second part is going to show you, more importantly, or just as important, how exercise can play an extremely important role in our health and the type of research that we do. So we'll start off by, obviously, human beings are capable of tremendous physical feats. We have women now who can consistently jump over two meters. We have divers jumping from 10 meter platforms, synchronized divers, able to do that in synchrony. From the power and grace and aestheticism of a, of a world-class gymnast, or a cyclist who can cycle for up to four hours at a speed that you or I could only cycle for 10 minutes. Human, the, the ability of the human body to adapt to physical exercise is absolutely phenomenal. However, if you look back and you look at the advances, and just to give you one concrete example, Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile right before your time, but it was, the, it was the holy grail of track and field. Who could be the first person to break the four minute mile? And Roger Bannister ran 359.4 seconds in the late 1950s. The current world record for the mile is held by Hashem El Garouche, who can run it in an astounding three minutes 43.16. And to put that in perspective, if Hashem El Garouche was finishing the race, if he was down here finishing the race, based on the best time of Roger Bannister, that's where Roger Bannister would be at the end of the race, almost 160 meters behind him. That's how, how far man has advanced. And we thought that the four minute mile, that no one would ever break it. It was humanly impossible. That's how far Roger Bannister would be behind the current world record if he was drawn against him the night he broke his world record. So sport has evolved and science has played a huge role in the, involve, in the evolvement of sport. However, and I just want to put one slide up on this, and I really want to make you aware of this. Unfortunately, many people cheat, and there is no room for cheating in sport. And unfortunately, many world-class athletes, such as Marion Jones from the United States, who won five Olympic gold medals, but all five have been taken off her because of drug abuse. And the same as you all are very familiar with, with Lance Armstrong. Drugs have no place in sport. Any person that can wake up in the morning and look at themselves in the mirror after taking performance-enhancing drugs, they have a lot of questions to answer. If you're going to do it, at least look yourself in the mirror and say, look, I give it my best. And that's a very, very important message. In contrary, or in, in contrary to this, one of the biggest advances, I think, in the last 50 years has been the involvement of women in sport at all levels. In 1984 was the first time a woman was allowed to run in the marathon in the Olympic Games. In fact, in the 1960s, there was no event longer than 800 meters for women. And I think it's absolutely fantastic to see that women can compete with men in every event, in every sport, and that's the way it should be, and long may it continue. What determines performance in elite sport? Well, the first thing is you have to have good genes. You can't put in what God left out. And as you'll see in a moment, anyone who stands on the starting line of an Olympic final is really a genetic freak. 
because that's why they're there. Otherwise, we would all be in the Olympics and we'd all be getting to the final. And if you think of a bell-shaped curve, they're out on the right-hand side. They're so, so different to the rest of us. It's not funny. Let me take three examples. The gentleman on your right and left are both students in DCU, but they're two phenomenal athletes, and the guy in the center is a phenomenal athlete. The guy to your right is Michael Murphy, who captained this year's Donegal team to win the All-Ireland. He's an undergraduate student. And the guy on the right is Brian Cullen, who captained Dublin the year before. He's a PhD student with me in DCU. And the guy in the center is David Rhodesia, the winner of the Olympic gold medal in the current in the pre, at the London Olympic Games. And what makes all of these three guys so unique, they have the genetic predisposition. That's what makes them the champions that they are. They have the genes. Because we could train, I could train as long as Michael Murphy or Brian Cullen or David Rhodesia. I was an 800 meter runner, and I can guarantee you I would never beat David Rhodesia, even if I trained to the same extent. And what makes Rhodesia so unique? He was the only individual in the Olympic Games in London who broke a world record. And only three people have broke the 800 meter world record in the last 33 years. That's what makes that guy so unique. In fact, he was in DCU recently. His coach is a Christian brother from Waterford who went to America, or went to Kenya 36 years ago. He was supposed to go for two years to teach geography. He had never been to a track meet in his life, and he has currently coached five Olympic gold medals and 38 world champions. A guy that knew nothing about athletics. So obviously working with these type of athletes, they have a genetic predisposition that makes them very, very unique. Michael Phelps has 21 gold medals. Again, everyone can't win 21 gold medals. Roger Federer has numerous Grand Slam titles. And then this guy here. This is the genetic freak of them all, okay? Because to stand on the starting line of an Olympic final, 100 meters, is a phenomenal feat. The eight fastest men on earth. And then one of them goes out and he runs 9.58 seconds. I mean, he's just so different to the rest of us. That's why he's there. So genes play a hugely important role in human performance. One of the things, one of the genetic predispositions is our fiber types. We're all born with two types of fibers, slow twitch and fast twitch. And if you take a look at this example here, these are slow twitch fibers. These are your sprinters and these are your middle distance runners. Both male and female sprinters have much, much lower levels of slow twitch fibers. And slow twitch fibers are excellent for endurance type of events. Whereas in contrast, your fast twitch fibers Okay, these are, if you see, here's a weightlifters, powerlifters, and bodybuilders. They have a high level of type 1 and low level of the slow twitch fibers. And that's why they are very, very good at those events. And people like Usain Bolt probably has a very, very high proportion of his fibers are fast twitch fibers. And as a scientist, we measure fast twitch fibers. And to show you the type of work that we do in our lab, how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to take a piece of muscle to do that because it's a fiber in your muscle. So what we do is we take an individual and we give an injection. Just to say, if you went to the dentist and you're getting your tooth out or you're getting some work done on your tooth, they put some lidocaine in to numb your mouth. Well, we numb the area that we're going to take the piece of, of, of muscle from. I hope there's no one squeamish here, okay? Then what we do is we make a small incision. It looks a lot worse than it is. We make a small incision, and just to show you, for those of you in biology, this is the fascia of the muscle down here. Every muscle, the sarcolemma, is the cell membrane. That's the fascia of your muscle. And that's a, it looks very big there. It's very, very small. A small incision. And in that incision, we use a biopsy needle. The biopsy needle is pushed down into the muscle, and we take a small piece of muscle sample, about the size of a pea. We store it in liquid nitrogen, and then we assess it. And this is what a sample would look like. That's a fiber type. The dark ones there are slow twitch fibers, and the white ones are, fa are, are fast twitch fibers. And they don't change. You're born with those. So if you want to be a really good sprinter, and you want to sprint in the Olympic final, make sure you have lots of fast twitch fibers. If you want to run the marathon in the Olympics, make sure you have plenty of slow twitch fibers. And then most of us are in between, and that's why there's a big shape. The bell-shaped curve is the way it is. We're all in the middle. In addition to looking at fiber typing, we can also look at your, your, most of you do biology, and we all know inside every muscle, there's a mitochondria. They're the factories that produce all the energy. And the more factories that you have inside your muscle, the more energy you can produce, and the more rapidly you can produce it. And we also measure those. There's the mitochondria. These dark, that's a mitochondria. There's another one, there's another one. This is a recent study we did. This was an endurance, a person we put on an endurance training program, and after the program, he had a lot more mitochondria, so he was able to produce a lot more energy, and that's the type of work that we can do with the muscle biopsy. 
Another important determinant of, of elite performance, and there's a big genetic component to this, is your maximal ability to consume oxygen. So your VO2 max, so your maximum aerobic capacity, measures the maximal ability of your lungs to take in oxygen, your heart to transport it, and your muscles to use it. So it's an integrative measure and is a large genetic component. We actually measure that. We take people and we put them on different types of exercise equipment and we increase, say you're on a bicycle, and we keep increasing the resistance so it gets more difficult, more difficult, so you keep, you consume more and more oxygen until you can't consume any more oxygen and we refer to this as your VO2 max. Now if you want to be an elite endurance runner, you have to have a high VO2 max, otherwise you cannot perform at an elite, at the pure elite event. And we test this on numerous modalities. On your right, that's a treadmill. In the center, you have a bike and on a rowing ergometer. We test it in different ways depending because there's no point in putting a rower on a bicycle or putting a rower on a treadmill because we want to the specificity. We want to test the muscles that they actually use when they're exercising. In fact, VO2 max is so important, it's regularly assessed in the space station. It's an extremely important parameter of human functioning. And if you look at this, is just men here. And at the very top, you see you have cross-country skiers. and the bottom, you have untrained. And we, we, we give your VO2 max in two numbers. You can get it in liters per minute. So you can see cross-country skiers have up to seven liters a minute, which is huge. Most boys in this room would have a VO2 max of around 3.5, and most girls around 2.5 to 3. And we also relativize it to their body weight. And as you can see, their VO2 max of elite athletes is up in the 70s and 80s. Now some of us, no matter how hard we train, we're never going to get to those numbers because there's a genetic ceiling. And I'm talking now at the elite world-class level of competition. So there's a genetic component to this as well. And the final example I will give you is what I believe is the most impressive record, world record. It's in the marathon. And it's the equivalent, it's 203.38. Now, the next day, if you live close to a track, I want you to try this. I want you to go out to the track and I want you to run one lap. And I would be amazed if more than 70% in this room, if more than 30% in this room could run one lap faster than 71 seconds. I'd be surprised. There'd be very few of you, unless you're a member of an athletics team, who would be able to run two laps in a row in 71 seconds. The world record in the marathon is currently 104 laps of the track, all in 71 seconds. That's running 26.2 miles at an average speed of four minutes and 43 seconds per mile. No one in here could run one mile in 4.43. That's phenomenal. So obviously, that person, obviously with a lot of training, but also had the genetic predisposition. That's an amazing, but it also shows you what humans can possibly, the, the, the potential of humans, the body, how the body can adapt. And unfortunately, the body adapts to activity by getting fit. It does the opposite when we're sedentary. And as we'll see in the latter part of this talk, it results in chronic diseases that afflict Western society and, and take up most of our healthcare budget. So genes are an important component. The other important component of performance is the environment. That's your lifestyle. It's how you train, your diet, your sleeping, your stress. All of these things are important. And basically, it's how your genes and your environment interact will ultimately determine how good you are in sport, how good anyone is in sport. And if you, if you take the analogy of an iceberg, if you look at the top of the iceberg, that's the performance. But the part of the iceberg you don't see, that's the training. That's all the hard work. You see David Radisha going out and breaking his world record, and you see Usain Bolt breaking his world record. But it requires a phenomenal amount, years upon years upon years of training, to get to that level of competition, to be able to, to compete at a world-class level. And what are the components? If you were to get someone fit, an, an athlete fit, and I'm just going to share some of them with you. The first thing is you may have to develop endurance, you have speed, you have strength, and you have flexibility. These are what we, we term the four basic components of, fi of physical fitness. If you combine speed and endurance, you get speed and endurance. If you combine speed and strength, you get power. And if you combine endurance and strength, you get strength and endurance. We also need for some sports agility, neuromuscular coordination, balance, and reaction time. Now, it's very, very easy if you're dealing with an individual sport, one person, you know exactly what they need to do, he or she needs to do. That's easy. But what happens when you're dealing with team sports? And you have a panel of 30 players, and they're all different. All genetic predispositions, all respond differently to training. It becomes a unique challenge. So training individuals versus training teams is very, very different. 
There are a number of scientific principles that we use. And all of you do this when you actually train, but you don't realize that you actually do it. So here's what happens. When you go out to train, what you do is you place a demand on the body that the body's not used to. If you go out for a hard run, you breathe hard, your heart rate goes up, and the one thing your body does not like, you have, as you, of course, you're all experts in biology. Who am I talking to here? Okay, You could give me this lecture. But think of the body. The body likes to maintain the internal environment. Your cells like to maintain a very, very rigid environment. They don't like large changes, whether it's an acidity or whether it's alkalinity or whether you're, you're breaking down tissue. It likes to keep this normal environment. It's called homeostasis. When you go out to exercise, you actually disrupt that. The body does not like when you exercise. Your cells don't like that. So what actually happens? You get temporary disruption to the internal environment and actually, when you train, think about it. If you went out for a 20-minute run or for a 40-minute run, a hard run, or did a hard rugby training session, and you come back in and I said, now, I want you to go out and repeat the same session, you wouldn't be able to do it. Because when you train, if this is a person, if X is their level of fitness, so here's someone's fitness level along here, and there's their fitness level here. They undertake a training session. They start here. At the end of the training session, if I was to assess their fitness again, their fitness actually would decrease your fitness level decreases with an acute bout of exercise. But what happens, and we refer to this stressing the body with exercise, we refer to this, you end up with fatigue, and this is called overload. And the amount of overload, the degree of fatigue or overload, will depend on the type of exercise, the intensity of exercise, and how long you exercise. It will also depend on your fitness level, and will also depend on your age. This will determine how you respond to exercise. So when you exercise, you actually disrupt your body. You overload it, you cause fatigue. And you might think, well, why do they want me to exercise? Well, let me explain. After you exercise, and this is the most important thing, your body recovers. So the cells and the tissues and the organs that are disturbed or disrupted during exercise, they're restored to their pre-training level. And in this example, it's 30, it took 36 hours just to get back. And that's called restoration after you exercise. So you come back to your baseline level. How long that takes will depend primarily on your fitness level and how, and how hard the actual training session was. And that's why it becomes difficult when you're dealing with a team. Two, half of the team could recover the next day, the other half it may take them an extra day to recover, and that's, that's the, the challenge that people who are involved with team sports have to face. But importantly, what happens now, and this is the key, your body adapts. Remember I said your body doesn't like large changes to its its internal environment. So what it does, it says, ha ha, the next time this person takes me out, I'm going to make sure that it doesn't cause such a disruption to the internal environment. So what does the body do? It adapts, it gets fitter. You increase the size of your muscle, you increase the number of mitochondria, you increase the number of capillaries supplying blood. All of these things, you increase the ability, you increase the amount of blood that you have in your system. You increase the ability of your heart to pump the blood. Your body adapts, so the next time you do the same amount of exercise, it won't be perceived as, as stressful on the body. And we call that adaptation. That's repetitive training. We add we can, an adaptation, and this occurs over time. It can be days, it could be weeks, but eventually you adapt, and look what happens. Your fitness level actually improves. And that's the science behind why we actually train. You don't get the benefits of training when you're training. You only get the benefits of training during recovery. And the biggest problem that we make in sport, particularly in Ireland, is that we don't value recovery. And for those of you who are playing on multiple teams, you have a huge problem, and we'll, we'll, we'll explore that in a moment. <laughs>